to our speaker today is Andrew Kraschel. And he is no str stranger to our club. I know some. I know there are some people here today that have not heard Dr. Kraschel before. Uh, while he is a comprehens comprehensive retina specialist, he is also a world-renowned clinician, scientist, and educator. Um, his, he just has a wealth of knowledge and an, an amazing person. Um, I said this the last time Dr. Kraschel was here, and he kind of looked at me, but. Uh, Forrest Gump said, there's an awful lot you can tell about a person by their shoes. <laughs> well, Dr. Koshel says, he can tell a lot about your health by looking into your eyes. Let's give Dr. Koshel a well work. School of Economics, and then he came back uh, during COVID, and he um, started working in our clinic, and he really liked it a lot. So he's taking his the rest of his pre-med courses, and he's up in Vermont. Um, so we were, and my uh, daughter is a graduate student in uh, at Columbia, New York City. So we compared t uh, temperatures <laughs> all the <day> month. <laughs> Yesterday was kind of fun. It was exactly zero degrees in Burlington, Vermont, 25 in New York, uh, or at least in the morning. Um, and then in uh, Florida, in Gainesville, where I was operating yesterday, it was 57. So this morning, my daughter sends a picture. She's in New York. She's heading to the library. She's like totally bundled up. <laughs> you know? And I didn't dare text her what the temperature and the weather is here. And in Vermont, it was minus 14 last night. <laughs> but uh, I have to tell you, my son loves Vermont, our family home there. That's the home where we grew up. And we, we've done it as brothers and sisters, and so we keep that family home. But uh, anyway, it's nice to be here with you. So what I wanted to, some of you have, uh, we've chatted about this before. Uh, what I wanted, Mary asked me for a title. And I always give a title, but then we have fun with sidebars and other interesting topics. Um, some of you may or may not know my, I'm a clinician scientist. My PhD is in biochemistry, and my special area of interest is in nutritional biochemistry and molecular biology. And I keep a, abreast of that field. It's also a, an excuse, uh, really, to uh, keep in touch with uh, nearly all of medicine, right? Um, nearly every human disease, some of you may have heard me say this before, but it's worth, uh, some of you are, are uh, new faces that I don't recognize, but nice to meet you, is that the retina is a very sensitive barometer of overall health and nutrition, because the retina, the photographic film of the eye, no thicker than tissue paper attached to the inner wall of the back of the eye, is the most metabolically active tissue per unit weight in the entire body. and it has the largest blood supply per unit weight in the entire body. So uh, just under the white part of the eye in all of us is a structure called the core. That's the largest blood flow and blood volume per unit weight in the entire body, more than the heart, more than the brain, more than muscle, more than any tissue, the liver, for that matter. So that turns out to be very important for many, many uh, human diseases. So being a biochemist, um, I'm always interested in uh, both nutraceutical and pharmaceutical approaches to retinal diseases. But as a consequence, by understanding those chronic diseases like macular degeneration, like glaucoma, right, like diabetic, diabetes, diabetic retinopathy, like strokes of the eye, these are fairly common disorders that we see. Uh, it's 
it, it, um, in order to really treat those diseases, you really have to know quite a bit of medicine. And I've given talks both nationally and internationally with my retina colleagues, saying, geez, you know, the eye is attached to a human being and to their body. So to just purely treat a retinal disease is actually, I, I would make the argument, it's incomplete medicine. You really need to have a snapshot of the patient's overall health, right? Uh, or at least an intermittent snapshot of what their health is doing, because that is a very important predictor of how their eye health, their brain health, and so on uh, will be doing. Uh, eye health, brain health, heart health, right? Liver health, muscle health, all of these go together. So that's on one side. Now, on the other side, and joint health. So the title of the talk was Joint Health and Macular Degeneration, What's the Link? I'm gonna get there <laughs> with all of you. Right? But, but along the way, I hope I can share information that will improve your health and, and do something today after you leave here. Um, that's, that's really important. And what the kinds of things I'm gonna to talk to you about, and some of you, as I said, have heard me say this before, it's not a prescription medicine. So it, it's not as compelling in some sense. People have actually studied this, right? It's not so compelling. When you write a prescription, people have the tendency to wanna to take that medicine, right? But what I'm gonna tell you about is not a prescription, but it's even more powerful, one could make the argument, than a prescription medicine. And that is these nutritional approaches to disease. And I'm going to tell you about some of them. I've mentioned others, but I'm uh, keen to share some new information with you today as well. And why that's so important. Now, chronic diseases, macular degeneration, joint health, which we're going to talk about in just a bit, right? Um, Alzheimer's disease, high blood pressure, coronary artery disease, age related muscle loss, AFib, right? There's lots of older folks who have AFib, right? Uh, obesity, uh, diabetes, uh, chronic renal disease, another huge problem in the United States, chronic lung diseases like COPD and asthma. At their core, they share a very similar biochemical mechanism. Now, at one level that may be surprising, but at another level it's not, and we'll come back to that in a moment. But here's the point. The point is that these chronic disorders are a direct consequence of two, three simple things. One is what we're consuming, the quality of the air, right? And what we put in our body, the liquids and the foods, right? And I suspect you know, over the years, we have you know, come to appreciate the, the folks in the villages like yourself are keen to continue playing pickleball, <laughs> tennis, golf, and so on, right? and are physically active. That's fantastic uh, um, to do that, to be physically active, but it's equally important, and perhaps one could make the argument even more important, to be very careful about what we're consuming. Okay? The food industry, right, paradoxically, paradoxically, is not really interested in American health. Any, or health in general, anywhere on the planet. They are really driven by profits, right? And nearly all processed foods are profoundly inflammatory and incredibly bad for our bodies. Let me give you a simple study. This was done with medical students at the University of Maryland many years ago. I like quoting this because it was actually done by physicians with, their, with medical students. They had the medical students, they measured inflammatory markers. You can measure those for blood tests, how much inflammation there is in the body. So they had a baseline of all these students. And again, this isn't published in the peer-reviewed literature. Had them go eat a McDonald's meal. Just one meal, right? Nothing extravagant, you know, uh, Big Mac, large fries, soda, and plus minus apple pie. <laughs> and then they measured the inflammatory markers over a period of time. And what they showed, quite compellingly, is the inflammatory markers went up very rapidly within a couple hours, two to four hours after the consuming that food. 
and they stay high for 24 to 36 hours. In 24 to 36 hours, these inflammatory uh, markers and the uh, inflammatory proteins and other compounds that are made in our body can wreak a tremendous amount of havoc in the body, right? Every single tissue you can name, right? Brain, heart, um, eyes. You may not notice it necessarily in your vision per se, but there's something happening, right? Heart, joints, muscles, right? So this type of in inflammatory insult, if you could imagine, if you're doing it consistently over a, a one's lifetime, it will eventually create quite a bit of damage. So here's another way to think about it. If you have a brick, let's say we have a brick here. A brick usually takes multiple poundings before it breaks, right? So you gotta keep pounding at it maybe 10, 12 times, maybe 20 times, and then finally the brick will break in half or into pieces. Likewise, the human body has tremendous resilience against any insult. So there's two basic insults. We're talking about the major one, which is nutrition, right? A nutritional insult, it almost sounds like an oxymoron. But what I mean by what you're consuming, right? Um, and what, what is unhealthy to consume, that is. And that creates this low-grade, consistent inflammation. It's like the pounding of the hammer on a brick. And what we want to do is stop, stop using that hammer altogether, right? And all of these chronic diseases that I mentioned earlier are directly related to this consistent, long-term, low-grade inflammation. Now, when we think of inflammation, we often think of pain or uh, uh, swelling and so on. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about low-grade inflammation over the lifetime of a, of a, of a person. <coughs> Now that low grade inflammation is also coupled with oxidative stress. You hear about antioxidants all the time, right? You hear them on TV, right? By the way, I, I think I've shared this and some of you already know this. We're the only country that allows pharmaceutical industry to advertise. That's really horrible because it's a, it's a tremendous disservice to the average lay person and it often puts physicians in a position where patients are coming in and saying, geez, you know, I saw this and, you know, why don't you try this on me, right? And uh, although I, I know for myself, I consider it a partnership uh, with a patient, that, that's an awkward relationship to have where the pharmaceutical industry is creating a demand, just like creating a demand for anything else, like a car or a TV. And I don't think that's really right in medicine. Um, the pharmaceutical industry, by the way, has the largest lobbying group in Washington, D.C., as does the healthcare industry. Every single senator and congressman, perhaps the only exception is Barry Sanders, <laughs> right, uh, has been bought out by these folks. That's why they don't want to leave Congress or Senate, because they're getting literally millions of dollars. This is actually well known, but it's, it's never covered, right, in the press per se. That's really disturbing because the pharmaceutical industry, this is a fun sidebar. Let me tell you a little something even more interesting. And I'll, I'll, I'll weave this back into this. It's always fun to share this almost. Uh, that's why I never bring slides. I brought slides, I get through one or two of them, and then, um, then it became a conversation like this. So where did Mark, the modern pharmaceutical industry arise from? It's a fascinating story in American business. John D. Rockefeller, everyone knows him. He was the first billionaire in the United States, right? His father was a snake oil salesman. He really was a snake oil salesman. Um, but John D. Rockefeller bumped into oil and became a billionaire. But he had a major problem. He, apparently, he was not a very nice person. I can't vouch for that myself, right? But it's well documented. So what he decided to do, uh, very bright guy, he, is he hired someone, and the whole field of public relations started with that person, right? A PR person, to rehabilitate his public image, or I should say rehabilitate, but to improve his public image. So this person uh, you know, spent time with Rockefeller, analyzed his assets, how people thought of him very negatively, right? And he just, you know, he wasn't particularly a warm person, as I understand or at least what's published in the biographies of, about him and the people he interacted with. 
So the, yeah, he came upon the idea of let's fund as a philanthropic activity the major medical schools around the country. Right, so Rockefeller University, all of you have heard of, we've all heard of New York City, one of the premier research institutes in the world. Uh, Harvard, Hopkins, Fox Chase Cancer Center in Philadelphia, and many others. And so this is what he did. He gave a ton of money, a significant amount of money, to build new buildings, build labs, uh, research labs, and so on and so forth. With a proviso. The proviso was that take his petroleum-based products and discover and find new uses in medicine for it. That's where the field of modern cancer chemotherapy came from. So he became a billionaire again, <laughs> and then some, right? Um, and this, this concept of interweaving the pharmaceutical industry into medical schools was really fostered by Rockefeller. Prior to that, what happened in the United States, <coughs> excuse me, is there was a tremendous emphasis on quote unquote natural medicine. There was a rich literature, it's still out there, if someone wants to go and probe it, of natural compounds, herbs, plants, so on and so forth, fruits, vegetables, very well researched, right? And their effect on the human body, the almost uniformly a positive effect, right? In fact, many of the cancer chemotherapy agents, by the way, uh, that are currently used are from natural products. And what the pharmaceutical industry does is because they can't patent a natural product, they modify it chemically and then patent that, right? It's quite interesting. It's, uh, so I can tell you this because I was involved in this. Uh, I, when I was at the University of Florida, I started four or five tech companies. And I quit all of that because one was with a billionaire in Miami. Um, it was all driven by money, right? And it was not really about helping people. It's about how much you can extract. That's really the right word to extract from the insurance companies and patients. That, that is the way it works. Now, do I use pharmaceutical agents? Of course I do, right? But I, I think I probably use it significantly more sparingly than most of my retina colleagues around the country, around the world, because there are other ways to at least help with um, uh, many retinal diseases, for sure, and other ocular conditions. So, so that was a, a little bit of a long sidebar, but that gives you a flavor of what has happened in the United States. Now, in Europe, it's slightly different. There still is a rich tradition of quote unquote natural medicine. Like in German medical schools, right? The medical students learn how to use herbs, um, plants, plant extracts, fruits and vegetables, how, what, how, which ones, how to use them in combination for many uh, diseases. Now, most medical traditions on the planet, right? Indian Ayurvedic medicine, Russian traditional medicine, South American medicine, African traditional medicine, Native Indian medicine in the United States have a rich tradition and a very deep understanding of how to use these, these natural things that are found around us all the time. Let me give you another uh, interesting example, broccoli. Some of you have heard me talk about broccoli. Broccoli has a compound in it called sulfurophane. Is discovered by one of my mentors uh, when I was a medical student at Johns Hopkins, Paul Talibay. He showed it was probably one of the most potent antioxidants that we know. It has other wonderful natural health benefits besides the eyes. Um, and, and that's been demonstrated over the years. Now, you never, so I kid about this, you never hear uh, about you know, broccoli being advertised. You hear about big pharma, right? There's no such thing as big broccoli, right? <laughs> Marketing budget. But if it could, it would be patented, but you can't, right? But it's incredibly good for your body, right? And it, on top of it, it's a wonderful anti-cancer agent. So what I tell patients is, make sure you're eating lots of bro broccoli, kale, spinach. Those three are loaded with sulfurophane. And they're, they're wonderful antioxidants, and they prevent the development of cancers. Now, is anything 100% known? It's not. 
but it's it's pretty darn good. Okay, that that's an example. Now coming back to this, these chronic disorders I mentioned to you, um, all of them share this inflammation and oxidative stress, right? And what are the other key elements in all of these chronic conditions? Uh, some of you may have heard this before. It's worth repeating because it's it's nice to get it in, in our mind. Is insulin dysregulation? What does that really mean? It doesn't mean that you're diabetic, right? What it means is that the way the body disposes of glucose, sugar, right? Now, refined sugar is really a poison. It is no different than alcohol. That's how it's processed in the liver, right? In fact, the number one cause of fatty liver in the United States is no longer alcohol consumption. It is consumption of uh, excessive amounts of refined sugar and high fructose corn syrup, right? Those should be as completely as possible eliminated from the diet. Sugar also, refined sugar, is a pro-carcinogen. In other words, it causes cancer, right? And it's pro-inflammatory. So you might imagine all of these disorders, or these chronic disorders, they have inflammation, uh, oxidative stress, they have this component that I just mentioned, glucose dysregulation, right? Or insulin dysregulation. That's incredibly, uh, that are uh, critical in the development of the disease, of these diseases. And what are the other three? The other three is something called mTOR. We talked about mTOR is a protein found in the cell. And it's the, lots of uh, us have heard about the ketogenic diet, right? Well, so what happens when we reduce our caloric intake sufficiently, and particularly reduce carbohydrates, the body goes into a condition, I won't call it a starvation condition, but a condition where it no longer uses glucose for energy, it uses ketones. Ketones are these small molecules that are made in the body. And actually the ketones in the brain and other tissues are more effective <coughs> energy sources than glucose, right? But what happens concomitantly is that the body generates a response. It's a protective response called autophagy by which it consumes debris within the cell. In other words, it clears out the cell. It's like, they, they think of it like a garbage disposal, right? It's clearing out all this debris, uh, spent proteins, spent uh, lipids, spent um, car carbohydrates, spent meaning usually they're oxidized, right? So that's where antioxidants, by the way, are useful as well, right? So this, the, the mTOR autophagy pathway is critical not only to help maintain, a, a nutri uh, maintain nutritional ketosis, but uh, allow for the body to clear all this debris. Okay. Now, let me tell you a little bit about AMD and uh, some work that was uh, a very talented graduate student in, in my lab nine uh, years ago before I transitioned to private practice. What she showed, um, well, um, we, so I, I put her on this project. I said, look, this is a very ambitious, ambitious PhD project, but let's see where you get with it. She, I knew she was, very, she was a very smart person and she was extremely hard working. And what we ended up showing was that use, uh, using a cell and animal models of macular degeneration, we could actually, by inducing the mTOR pathway by either caloric restriction, so you can reduce the amount a mouse eats or a human being eats, how much do you have to reduce? By 25%. Now, that's a lot for the average human being, by the way. Any of us reducing our caloric intake intake by 25%. But in any case, if we did that, by inducing autophagy, this process of cell feeding, the changes from dry macular degeneration in the mouse models could be completely resolved. Now, uh, simultaneously, we did a set of experiments where we looked at discovering compounds, natural compounds, actually, that could mimic the same effect of caloric restriction, right? And we did, we discovered a whole set of them. I'm gonna tell you about a couple natural ones that you can go out and uh, uh, start consuming today, right? Um, 
But um, uh, I'm going to come back to that moment. See, I've got to keep you guys to some degree. Sorry. But I, I, I can't keep a secret for long. <laughs> um, so what we showed was there was a whole set of compounds that we that were discoverable. We discovered them. And then we tested them in these mouse models of macular degeneration. Now I'm going to tell you about one compound, then I'll tell you about the natural compounds too. This compound is called rapamycin. It's actually found in soil bacteria. That's how it was discovered. It's a natural compound actually. Right? It's used routinely in the United States at five milligrams a day for kidney transplant patients. So it's an immunosuppressant at fairly high doses. So when we discovered this, when I was at the University of Florida, I talked to a couple of my friends who are transplant nephrologists there. And I said, geez, you know, I'm not interested in a transplant dose of five milligrams. What I want to do is have a dose, a dose much lower than that, whereby we can stimulate this process of autophagy. And so the dose we arrived at, and the dose that I used in a set of patients, I'm going to tell you about that in just a moment, is one milligram every other day. So in other words, 0.5 milligrams a day. That's one-tenth of the immunosuppressive dose. And what we showed, <coughs> as, I, as I mentioned, we showed in the mouse model that it was, it was pretty remarkable uh, how effective it was. What I didn't tell you was is that we tested it in multiple mouse models of retinal diseases. Right? So I mentioned macular, you can create macular degeneration in the mouse. There's an inherited disorder of human beings, and believe it or not, mice develop this, in, in, uh, or a set of them that can be inherited. It's called Stargard disease. Stargard disease is the most common inherited macular disorder that we know of. And it has um, clinical appearance that's essentially no different from macular degeneration. And the biochemistry, the biochemical basis of the disease is very similar to macular degeneration. So that was very tantalizing uh, when we discovered this. So, um, so here's another piece of information you can impress your friends with. 80% of drugs that are used in the United States are used off-label. What does that mean? So let's say, for example, you just, uh, patients or clinicians and scientists discover a medicine that's useful for heart disease. Then. Uh, over time, they discover, well, geez, that same medicine at a different dose is very good for retinal disease. There are cases of that, by the way, right? There's a medicine, and I'll tell you one the example that, I'm, uh, uh, that I, I can illustrate for you, is there's a medicine called atenolol. It's a beta blocker. It's used for heart disease, right? It's incredibly effective for patients with ocular migraine. In fact, I prescribe it for them. So sometimes I even prescribe it instead of them wanting to take a pill. We, uh, there's another medicine that we use that's a beta blocker as a drop. And I tell them to put one drop under the tongue. We have lots of patients who've had chronic migraine. Could, they've tried every single medicine known to the neurologists and the medicine. They come to see us for other reasons. They, have to, uh, they don't come off to see me for migraine, per se, but in, in talking to them, we, discovered they have a migraine. I said, well, geez, let's try this. And it's pretty remarkable. Here, here is a drug that was originally discovered for uh, heart disease. And it has a profound, wonderful effect on curing patients with ocular migraines. And some with standard migraines as well. That's called an off-label use. Even though there's a published study to use this medicine for ocular migraines, the FDA considers this an off-label use. 80% of it, drugs that are used in the United States are used off-label. Let me give you another example. When patients have a very severe infection in the eye, <coughs> excuse me, we inject antibiotics into the eye, vancomycin and septazidine. Those medicines are typically taken oral, but that's the stand gold standard for treating an ocular infection. That's an off-label use of those antibiotics. It's accepted all over the world that that's the, that's the treatment for severe infections of the eye. Um, another example, then I'll come back to our regularly scheduled program here, <laughs> is many of you have, have or know of friends or have had knee, uh, 
transplants, right? Replacements, I should say, hip or knee. Guess what? That has never undergone a placebo, randomized, controlled clinical trial approved by the FDA. Never. Bone marrow transplant, which is used routinely for certain types of certain types of leukemias and lymphomas, exactly the same thing, right? Though even those are those are gold standard treatments, that's an off-label use of the radiation, right? Or removing the joint, putting a new one in, right? So, um, but getting back to this uh, about rapamycin, so uh, many years ago, it's what, maybe 10, 12 years ago now, in a set of patients who had Starbucks disease when I was at the University of Florida, and I, they still come to see me on private practice, some of them up under the can handle and some in and around the insular areas and some in the land as well. This disorder, Stargardt's disease, as I told you, is very similar to macular degeneration. But here's what happens, is the vision drops precipitously within the first uh, 10 to 15 years of life, okay? And then it stabilizes out at 2400, and their vision continues to stay really um, blurry for the rest of their life. So if you catch these uh, kids early enough, which we were fortunate to do, Instead of their vision going like this, and then going like this, it went like this, and it went like this. That was pretty remarkable. Um, a couple of them are, uh, are nurses now. Um, they work, they drive, and so on. And that was immensely satisfying uh, to watch these young people recover vision, which is, as I said, in this disorder, not uh, it never occurs that way. So we decided also at the same time to try this in a set of patients with a certain type of dry macular degeneration, at exactly the same dose, one milligram every other day. And we have, about, I would say, about 30, 40 patients that have put on this medicine. I explained to them this is a, it's used a, traditionally, uh, FDA approved for, um, as an immunosuppressant, but we're using it at one-tenth the dose. And uh, I explained to them the science behind it and why it might be worthwhile pursuing it because there's no other medication available for that or treatment at this time. And we've had some pretty remarkable results with patients with a certain form of dry macular degeneration, having vision recovery and the clearance of this debris by this auto-eating process. We can image that debris in clinic. And so that's actually very, very satisfying to see that. Now, now that's a prescription medicine. I, was going to, I told you I was going to tell you what are some natural ways we can do this. Now, many of you have heard me about that Indian yellow spice turmeric, right? Turmeric at a decent dose will do the same. It's anti-inflammatory, but it has this other remarkable property of affecting um, this process of self-clearing of materials in the cell. So turmeric is one. The other is a compound called berberine. Berberine also stimulates this, this clearance property. Um, uh, or auto clearing, I think you think of it. It's, the autophagy actually means self eating, right? But it's, as I told you, it's like clearing the debris within the cells. <coughs> now, why is that important? So, it's, yeah, it's important for retinal disease, but all these chronic disorders, including joint disease and joint health, it's incredibly important to stimulate that process. It, you can think of it as a way to rejuvenate the cells in the body, okay? Now I have to tell you, um, knock on wood, with God's grace, I don't have any chronic disorders, but we've been, my family and I have been taking these supplements um, that, that I've designed over the years, for many years now, and so do our kids for that matter. So um, that's at least two examples, uh, or two compounds that are natural products that I would really strongly encourage everyone to <coughs> okay. um, And I can talk to you about dosing later on if you'd like to. There, um, we're actually working, those two, by the way, interestingly, um, the largest suppliers of, or, um, where it's found most commonly, and as a consequence, the largest suppliers are in India, right? So um, I've been talking to the company to try to develop those into a, a 
a nice capsule. We, we have, uh, we developed a turmeric, a patented formula for that, but we're also working on berberine as well because berberine has other wonderful properties in the body besides reducing inflammation, affecting autophagy, right? It also helps regulate blood sugar. In fact, it's actually more potent than metformin and safer. There's published clinical trials around that. So, um, this, so what is this link that I was talking about? It's actually, it's a link to all chronic diseases, not just joint disease as well, right? What are the other things, the other pathways? So let me just review for the moment, right? We talked about low-grade inflammation, oxidative stress, right? Glucose dysregulation, right? And remember, that doesn't, glucose dysregulation can occur in a person who does not have diabetes. That's most of us. Uh, here's another interesting point to make. All of us, this is a study many, many years ago, go into a diabetic state. In other words, we develop diabetes and then come back out of it, right? Now, the body has this remarkable resilience to do that, right? There's, then there's a set of people who fall into a diabetic state and stay there for an extended period of time, perhaps for the rest of their life, and or they recover over a period of time, and then they're no longer diabetic. But most of us actually go into a diabetic state probably once or twice a month, right? And the reason why we don't know that is because we don't detect it, right? Now with these, you know, some of you have seen these, and perhaps some of you have them, these uh, continuous glucose monitors, where they can put it on their arm, insert it in their arm with their cell phone, they can swipe, uh, monitor and tell the uh, glucose level. Those are fantastic, uh, especially uh, in patients who have type 1 and type 2 diabetes. There's multiple companies that make those. There's actually going to be a watch monitor available shortly as well, which will be even easier. You just put it on your wrist and you can look, check your blood sugar all day long. In fact, everyone should be doing that daily. But anyway, coming back to this, so the glucose dysregulation and this concept that you don't necessarily have to be diabetic, right? So then, what does it mean to fall into a diabetic state and come back out of it, right? What it means is that there's huge fluctuations in blood sugar, right? Where do those fluctuations come from? Refined sugar and high fructose corn syrup. So if you, what I t tell um, patients all the time is, if it's in a can, don't eat it, <laughs> right? Canned food is notoriously loaded, and you can read it on the label. They disguise it very cleverly sometimes. It may not say, uh, you know, refined sugar or high fructose corn syrup. It may use a chemical name, right? But never consume a canned product, right? The vegetables and fruits are probably pretty good in it, right? But it's what they place it in, right? Sometimes it's soy oil. Soy itself is good for you, but soy oil is profoundly inflammatory. Or it's in some thick, syrupy glucose. Um, or high fructose corn syrup, right? Um, so that's that's where that sugar is coming from, and it's it's almost ubiquitous, right? So what's the what's the solution to that problem? There's two: one, eat fresh fruits and vegetables, right? And or use a natural sweetener. What are the two best? Stevia, far and away, right? That's a natural compound. It comes from the stevia plant. One patient told me years ago, I never go into Walmart that frequently, but Walmart was actually selling stevia plant. Maybe they still do. And people just take the leaves, grind them up, and put it in their tea or coffee. It's quite sweet. Now, most patients or people don't like the taste of stevia. They talk about an aftertaste. That's because it's not good quality. It's not because of the intrinsic sweetness. Stevia is almost 2,000 more sweet than sugar is, right? Table sugar. So you have to experiment. I, I know Publix has all different wonderful brands. You try different ones. There is a couple companies that are that make it. It's a little bit more expensive, and they sell it off the web. They don't have a, um, a storefront um, that make really high quality stevia that has zero aftertaste. They even make candies out of stevia. Gum. Hot chocolate, it's really good, <laughs> right? Um, so uh, stevia, and what's the other one? Mung fruit extract. 
those two are healthy. Okay. But the key, so three key elements for reducing glucose dysregulation and insulin dysregulation, right? Get rid of refined sugars. Wherever you see it, exit out of your diet, right? And I'll tell you that at home, we don't have refined sugar. It took us about three to five years, right? But we have really high quality stevia. My daughter loves to bake, we use bake with stevia, right? And if you need it, like for example, this morning on my drive down, my wife and I were having wonderful Indian tea that she makes. And we use, we've used stevia for years. It tastes just fine. It, it took a little bit to get used to it. It is slightly different than sugar, but it, after a while you never notice it. What is it? You need about 21 days to break it. Uh, psychologists say 21 days to break a habit. And once it's broken, then you're full of it, right? So I, I'd encourage all of you to do that. Now, why is that important, important in these chronic diseases and joint health as well, right? I mean, I'm highlighting joint health. I'll tell you why at the end in just a moment. Because what is it about refined sugar and glucose dysregulation that creates all this havoc in the body? It's because here's what happens. So let's say our blood sugar goes up. That's a stimulus to the pancreas to produce insulin. Right, so insulin has to rise to drive blood glucose down. Where's the bulk of our blood glucose go, by the way? It goes into our big muscles, right? Our thighs, right? Calves and so on. So what is a simple thing you can do right after you eat, right, to get your blood sugar down? It's about this easy. <laughs> do that for about five minutes. People have actually studied this. It drives blood sugar down. And go for a walk. 20 to 30 minute walk is plenty to exercise the big muscles of the leg. That drives blood sugar down. It also reduces inflammation. Right? But coming back to this, so insulin rises to help um, dispose of that high blood sugar. right? But here's the consequence of insulin. Insulin is a pro-inflammatory hormone. It creates tremendous inflammation in the body. So really what we want to do is, right, so in, the, a better way to eat is instead of having three large meals, is to have smaller meals or just have one meal at the end of the day, right? Actually, that's what my wife and I typically do. We're so busy in the clinic, right? So we, we have a nice healthy snack and then just have a nice dinner and that's about it, okay? So the way you want to eat or we should eat is either nothing and then just a little bit of a, a, a decent meal, right? And <coughs> or, or having multiple small meals. Why? Because the blood sugar doesn't rise so high. And as a consequence, the insulin levels don't rise so high to dispose that blood sugar, right? And as a consequence, there's less inflammation in the body. Okay? So that's inflammation. Now we've talked about uh, the next one, uh, that's blood sugar side. We talked about the insulin, I mean, I'm sorry, the mTOR pathway, that process of autophagy slash in inducing nutritional ketosis, right? So I mentioned to all of you about these two compounds, turmeric and berberine, right? And also, what else can you do? By reducing carbohydrates, it not only helps with insulin or blood sugar uh, dysregulation, right? But it also helps with inducing clearing of the cells, and inducing nutritional ketosis. Now, I, let me just talk about that for a moment, because it's a really hot topic, right? Ketogenic diet and so on and so forth, right? To actually go into nutritional ketosis, that's a medical term where the ketone bodies are at a certain level, which can be measured by a pinprick, okay? To get, go into nutritional ketosis and maintain it is very, very hard. It's not so simple, you know, you read about these ketogenic diets, you Google it, you get 10,000 hits, right? And every company or health place has their version of the ketogenic diet. But what you should probe into that is how are they measuring it, right? If you can't measure it, you don't know what you're doing, right? So the proper way to determine if you are in nutritional ketosis is to do repeated finger strength sticks with a ketone monitor. It's just like a glucose monitor, right? 
can do a pinprick. Now, most people don't have the time nor the desire to pin, uh, prick their finger. I can tell you, I don't. <laughs> and I, I know most people are like that. They're, they're developing non-invasive ways to measure um, ketones, including uh, measuring it out of breath, right? uh, which may be more useful and easier to do. I actually have one of those. I bought one of those. So I'm a science junkie, so I buy all this stuff. <laughs> it's not very expensive. And, and the boss, who's a practice administrator, and my wife, uh, she allows me to buy this stuff. Because she knows I'm curious about all this. Um, and so I, I measured it over a couple of weeks. It is really hard to maintain, the, you can fall into nutritional ketosis or get into the nutritional ketosis. It is very hard to maintain it. Even eating a little bit will drive you out of nutritional ketosis. But what you can do that is pretty closely equivalent to nutritional ketosis is intermittent fasting or restricted eating. What does that mean? What that means is instead of eating all day long, right, is you say, okay, look, I'm, like that's a, uh, what, I, what I'm describing, what uh, my wife and I do, many, many people do this, right, is you decide, well, you know what, I'm going to consume the, the bulk of my calories or all my calories between, let's say, 4 p.m. and 8 p.m., and that's it. Right? There's really wonderful studies to show um, by scientists actually out of Southern California, Dr. Ponda, um, that by doing so, that has a wonderful effect of resetting our metabolism. And it drives all these other processes that I was talking about, inflammation, oxidative stress, immune dis uh, sorry, um, glucose dysregulation, mTOR activation, right? The other two that I haven't talked about, I'm going to talk about this in a moment. But it improves mitochondrial dysfunction and vascular health. And those are the six key elements for these chronic disorders. Okay? So time-restricted eating slash intermittent fasting. What does intermittent fasting mean? I've shared this before. What it means is to, let's say you, uh, let's say you have dinner or you finished your last caloric intake between six and eight o'clock. Then don't eat anything again, if you do like breakfast, don't eat anything again for at least 12 to 14 hours, right? So have a late breakfast or a brunch, okay? This has a very profound influence on the body. Uh, we, you can reset your metabolism. In fact, one of the cures, and again, it's not a prescription, as I was mentioned at the onset, for diabetes, type 2 diabetes, is to fast. Now, it's most people that's really hard to do. If you can fast, a, basically a water diet, over a weekend, there's studies to show this, you can reset your entire metabolism for the next month. So the body has this intrinsic memory, metabolic memory, of what it, what's transpired. And it's such a profound reset that you can really significantly impact the development and the progression of these chronic disorders that I was mentioned. Okay? Now, let me tell you about the last, what time is it? Oh my God, we're having way too yeah. much fun. When, when do I need to finish? Uh, about five minutes. Okay. Um, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so let me tell you about the last two. Mitochondrial dysfunction and vascular health, they go together, right? And vascular health is something close to Mary's heart because of her interest in the beaver, right? Now, mitochondrial dysfunction, what does that mean? Mitochondria are the energy factories in the cell. And as we get older, they actually produce less energy. We know that for a fact, and their number decreases. Like each cell typically has a variable number of mitochondria. For example, metabolically active tissue like the retina, the brain, the heart have more mitochondria, energy factories per cell, than other tissues like the pancreas. <clears throat> okay. Now, what is a way to increase energy production and the number of these energy factories? Number one, far and away, it's not even close, is exercise. 30 minutes, as I mentioned, 30 minutes of walking and twice a week of some resistance training. 
30 minutes of that, right? Even lightweight lifting. That's all I ever do, by the way. I don't, uh, I'm not really interested in bulking up. What you really want to have is good tensile strength of the muscle, right? And, and walking is an excellent exercise. It's way overlooked for reasons I'm not sure. You don't need a treadmill. It's Florida, you can go outside. Or even up north, you can, you can go outside for a walk. It warms you up anyway, right? Walking not only has this tremendous effect uh, on, on, in terms of the metabolism, right? But it increases those energy factories. It's profoundly anti-inflammatory, and it stimulates endogenous stem cells in the body. Well known. Experience. If the pharmaceutical industry could, they would patent exercise, but you can't, right? It has it's such an amazing metabolic effect on our bodies, right? And you don't have to do a ton of it, right? Like you see in the, you know, these ads for these gyms, you know, these guys working out, and they look like Mr. America. You don't have to do any of that. All you have to do is 30 minutes every day and or stretching exercises. Maybe some other time we can talk about some very simple, straightforward stretching exercises that have a wonderful impact on metabolism. Right? So um, the other ways that you can stimulate the mitochondria, these energy factors, to produce more energy and or increase their number is a compound. It's a natural compound that decreases with age. It's called alpha lipoic acid. Now, it's actually the German version which the clinical trials have been done. It has alpha lipoic acid is a fun compound to talk about, but I'll just tell you a couple of things because we're running out of time. It is, it's an antioxidant. It binds heavy metals, right? And it has been shown, actually I have some of my patients here in the villages, uh, their spouses have uh, chronic liver failure and I would refer them to a very good friend of mine. He's a physician. Uh, he used to be at Cleveland Clinic, but he now lives in New Mexico. They go out to visit him periodically, Dr. Burke Burks. And he was the one who first showed you can actually regenerate the liver by giving patients alpha lipoic acid. It's, also, it's on TV. I chuckle when I see it on TV these days for neuropathy. Um, now, I can tell you that ad is, although the ad is correct in what it portrays, the alpha lipoic acid that they use is, it comes from China. Now, there's nothing, I have tons of Chinese colleagues and they're wonderful people. But I will tell you, it's not because it's from China, it's because it's cheap. That's why they have that. And it's available, at, you know, the ad said you were available at your CVS, Walgreens, Walmart, and all these places. That's not the really high quality alpha lipoic acid. It's the European and German version. And there's, that you'll never see advertised, right? There's only a few places in the country that have that. <coughs> okay, so mitochondrial dysfunction, and finally, vascular health, right? What can you do for vascular health? We've already talked about it to some degree, right? Exercise, you can't beat it, right? And um, Mary, I'm sure, has talked to you about the humor, or some of you know about uh, the beamer that improves microcirculation. But here's what else you can do for yourselves. Simple enough, beets, arugula, cilantro, as much as you can possibly consume every day, right? Now you have to be careful with beets because there, there's a ton of sugar in it, right? <coughs> so, um, have, and beet leaves also. What these compounds do is they produce this natural gas in our body called nitric oxide. It's not related, to, it's not the gas of our tummy, it's not flagellum. That gas actually helps improve the health of the blood vessels, and it helps dilate them. That's important for all of us, okay? So beets, arugula, cilantro, and exercise are simple ways with many, many published papers in the medical literature of their effectiveness, okay? I'm gonna stop there because Mary got up. <laughs> I'll, I'll stop there, the, there's always more to, to discuss. Um, but thank you so much for listening. I'm happy to take questions yes, afterwards. Question. Any questions? Yes. <laughs> I, um, the natural ketosis that you're talking about. Yeah, compared, nutritional ketosis. Okay. Compare to Atkins ketosis where you yes. urinate on strips. Yes. What's the difference? So they're very similar. So, Fred, um, the question was what's the difference between nutritional ketosis and what Atkins diet recommends, right? 
That also is a low carbohydrate diet with high fats, right? Now fats, it doesn't mean, you know, strips of bacon per se, right? It means like things like healthy fats, like avocado, right? Eggs, egg, egg, the egg has been maligned for, I don't know how many years. It's a really good thing to have, by the way. It's good to have in your diet, right? Um, coconut oil, right? Those, are, those kinds of fats are good, healthy fats for the body, and they will help in maintaining nutritional ketosis, similar to the Atkins. Now, Atkins didn't push, per se, um, using these, uh, these healthy fats, but he talked about significant reduction in total carbohydrates, right? Well, yes, please. Uh, you mentioned uh, doing carbohydrate restriction and uh, the fasting with diabetes for yes. over a weekend. Yes. What if you experience a sugar low? Yes. I mean, because I can Now, you need to do that if you're a diabetic, right? You need to do this under the supervision of a physician, okay? okay. And or if you're somebody who's checking your blood sugar regularly, or so you have a continuous glucose monitor, then that's that's the proper way to do it. So would you eat something nutritional to yes. prevent that low if you got Yes. Good. As you know, are you diabetic? Yes. Okay. Um, that wasn't to put you on the spot. No, 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 no. So in diabetics, the key, as you know, is that it's the low. Right. Right? It's not so much the high, right? It's this fluctuation of doing this that causes damage to the blood vessels and other tissues. Right. So the idea is to try to maintain the blood sugar as best as you can if you're going to do a fast, right? Now there are nutritional supplements that can help you maintain that, right? Alpha lipoic acid is one of them. Berberine is another one. There's a, uh, and I have no financial interest in this company. It's called You Can. You, you can write it down. It's, it's a husband and wife. They developed this. It's like granola, right? And that, in fact, that's what I munch on during clinic, right? And they developed it because there's, I think it was their son, uh, had this metabolic carbohydrate metabolism problem, right? And what you, it's, a, it's actually packed with, and it tastes really good. It comes in, um, I get the chocolate version, they have the vanilla version as well. And we buy like 10, 12 packs at a time, put it in our pantry, and we take one, we just bring it to clinic. And I have a little bit. And what it does is it just maintains blood sugar all the time. Right. So you might want to look at that. Okay. It's, like I said, it's a patented formulation for, they originally developed it for their son, right? And now it's available, it's, it's just available on the web. Okay. But it, I can vouch for that. And the science is superb around that. That might be something you can take if you're going to do this uh, 24, 46, 24, 48 hour fast. Okay, great, thank you. Okay? Oh, yes, you please. Can you talk about yes. How do you know which one is good? Fantastic question. How do you know what's good quality berberine and turmeric? That is the problem. <laughs> now, I can, I can vouch for hours because I helped design it. It's a patented formulation, and it gets absorbed in the gut 1,600 fold better than anything else that's out there. Berberine, that's more problematical. We're working with this company out of India. They're one of the major suppliers, extremely high quality. I've been working for the last two years. COVID kind of turned things sideways for all of us. And we'll, hopefully we'll have it out later this, this uh, in about three, four months. We're just finalizing the formulation. I'm really excited about it. I'll just tell you a little bit about it. it is, it'll have berberine in it, alpha lipoic acid. So when you have those, it, so you know, Mother Nature, um, there's other things that you have to account for. When you take berberine and alpha lipoic acid, you also need to have a decent amount of vitamin C and B complex of vitamins. That's another problem on that televised one that you see on TV for alpha lipoic acid, is taking alpha lipoic acid alone is not a good idea. You have gotta take a lot of B-complex of vitamins because alpha lipoic acid causes the consumption of the B-complex of vitamins. There's 11 B vitamins, by the way, right? And vitamin C as well. So the alpha lipoic acid that we have in the clinic, right, is, so I'm the one who, I'm the one who formulated that. That's the German version with the B complex of vitamins and vitamin C. We originally formulated it really for our diabetic patients, but it's, I can tell you, we take it for good health and our patients, we, we gave out a, a, in the beginning, uh, a 
to some of our patients here in the villages, they notice their energy levels improved fairly dramatically. You want them to try it, okay? So I can vouch for those, right? Berberine, not so much. There is a gazillion companies with berberine. I've looked at at least a set of them on the web because patients are asking me which one to take, right? And then finally, as I said, about two and a half years ago, I said, well, geez, you know, it's time to formulate something that makes biochemical and clinical sense and is high quality. So eventually we'll have it. Yes? Do you have a, do you have a uh, dosage for turmeric? Turmeric, yes. Turmeric. Okay, now straight turmeric, right, doesn't get absorbed very well. I can tell you hours, it's two capsules per day, right? And this is, a, this is not a sales pitch for us, I'm just sharing it, that it, it's really outstanding. You see, the catch with it, like in Indian cooking, I noticed like my mom, my wife, and a tremendous number of Indian women who cook, or guys for that matter, right? <laughs> rarely, is when, they, when turmeric is used in Indian cooking, it's always done with a little oil. And the oil solubilizes the turmeric so it can be better absorbed across the gut. So like if you sprinkle turmeric, like you can buy it from uh, Publix, right? Yeah, if you sprinkle turmeric, it's good for your gut, but it's not getting, very little gets into the body. Extremely little. Now some people spike the turmeric with um, uh, black pepper, right? To try to improve the, uh, the absorption. And it helps to some degree. Yeah. So if you have it at home, and if you want to do it yourself, right? So you take some turmeric and just a touch of oil, right? And that'll help solubilize the active components. Yes, is there another question? Uh, yes, please. Okay, you said cilantro. Yeah, cilantro. I can't stand that, and I know that some people can. Yeah. So what are you gonna do, right? Yeah, right. beets, arugula, yeah. right. Those are wonderful. Yeah. Rupa, you can put in your salad all the time, right? Yeah, so CoQ10 works by a different mechanism. CoQ10 is to help those energy factors in the cell, right? There's even wonderful studies to show that in patients with heart disease, it's very effective, right? So uh, the turmeric is, has different properties than CoQ10, per se. Yes, please. Standard processing makes some very nice extracts, that company, right? Life Extension, a set of theirs uh, products are very good. I'm very familiar with them. They're, um, if you go on their, you know, they have those um, uh, research pages where they describe and they have references. Those are fantastic. And I guide patients to that. What? Life Extension is the name of the company. You can find them on the web. They're actually in, uh, in this based in Southern Florida, South Florida. Yes? What is ocular migraine compared to this regular Yeah, so the question is, what is ocular migraine versus a regular migraine? So migraine is typically a headache that orig originates in the head. In ocular migraine, patients can have like a scintillating uh, visual field, partially their visual field disappears. Um, <coughs> They, they can have constriction of their visual field. Some patients, it's a total darkening of the visual field, but it usually goes away in 15 to 20 minutes, okay? There can be a headache associated with it, and sometimes not. It can sometimes be associated with tingling in the fingers, around the mouth, or the tongue, right? That, that's what we do. And the other key feature of an ocular migraine is the eyes are structurally normal. In other words, there's no intraocular explanation for the, uh, the migraine symptoms. Well, I have that, you know, I think this, and then it takes like 20 minutes, and, yeah, and it, it, and it the, goes long, and yes. it goes long. Yes. But I never have a headache or anything. So, so that's a classic, body. yours is a classic ocular migraine. Yeah. yeah. Now, some people, it doesn't bother them, so we know it's related to stress for sure. Now, that's easy to say, reduce stress. We all have stress, right? Um, but as best as you can, reduce stress. Tea, coffee, chocolates are also known inducers of ocular migraines. Uh, I think when mine was done, I always figured it redid my brain. And then I'm good to go. Back to tea. Good. Other questions? Uh, uh, yes, please. Maybe it's not exactly when it's tracked, but 
talk about bone health and bone yes. health. What about brain health or allergies? Like yeah, brain health, right? Uh, so you're, these same, um, remember I said saying Alzheimer's or age-related, uh, you know, mild cognitive impairment or age-related memory loss, right? All of these macular degeneration, glaucoma, joint health, they're all related to those six processes that I was telling you about, right? Very clearly, there's, there's unambiguous published clinical data to support that. Here's an interesting sidebar. So in other words, do all of those things that I mentioned <laughs> to finish that loop. But here's what's even more remarkable. There's about 330 clinical trials that have been done for Alzheimer's disease. Guess how many have been shown to be effective? Exactly zero. Do people, do neurologists prescribe those, or psychiatrists prescribe those medicines? Yes, right? Because there's pharmaceutical companies that push them, right, as it were, right? They have zero effect, right? The major antidepressant drugs, if you actually look at the clinical trials, I went back to look at this because of this interest in chronic diseases, and then I called a bunch of, of my psychiatrist friends I said, you know, look, I just read this literature. Tell me if I'm missing something. I said, it seems to me in all these placebo-controlled, randomized clinical trials that are published in the top flight journals, not one of them work. They chuckle, they go, Shilesh, you got it. Isn't that amazing? Uh, so depression is a chronic dis disorder. We know there's inflammation in the brain, right? And just as another uh, more timely sidebar, is COVID, you hear about long COVID and this brain fog. As soon as you hear about brain fog, or a friend says to you, you experience it, they feel like your thinking is fuzzy, that's inflammation in the brain. Every day, all day, 24-7, 365, right? So that's inflammation of the brain, and you want to have an anti-inflammatory diet as quickly as possible. And it clears by itself. So I guess you work on allergies as well on that. Um, now, allergies are slightly different, right? Uh, there can be chronic allergies, uh, but allergies are often environmentally induced. The major cause of allergies by endogenous allergies are six foods, far and away gluten, right? Eggs, milk, peanuts, corn, and soy, right? So when I tell patients, like we have lots of patients with allergic eye disease, at first, I try to understand whether it's environmentally induced, you know, because we've had all this weird rain in Florida over the last three to four months, right? Is it because of that, or is it because it's nutritionally induced? And even if it seems like it's environmental, I would encourage people to go gluten-free, right? I've had patients with dry eyes or allergic and or allergic eye disease. They go gluten-free, no drug, no prescription medicines, and their symptoms go away within really 10 to 12 days. Gluten is clearly linked to brain dysfunction too. And it's linked to retinal dysfunction. Now, all these chronic diseases, heart dysfunction, right? <coughs> Good. Other questions? Yes, please. A little louder? Uh, oh, Vermont? Yeah. And is that acceptable to say Oh, maple syrup? You're speaking to somebody who grew up in Vermont. I love Vermont maple syrup. But you don't want to guzzle it, right? Just a little bit. <laughs> or honey. Yeah. What's that? Honey. Yes, honey. honey. Yep. What about it? Honey. It's good for you. A little bit, right? Yes. Yes. So you got to, if you can get farm fresh honey, that's the best thing to do. I'll tell you, in Gainesville, um, because of COVID, everything got, as I said, got turned sideways. Now these these um, these markets on Saturday morning, the local farmers in and around Gainesville, where we live, they bring in fresh honey, fresh greens, fresh everything. And it's it's just simple. It smells great just walking around. Okay. Yes, please. Just uh, <laughs> Mary, Mary can tell you. <laughs> Good. All right. Other other questions I can answer. Wonderful. Oh uh, yes, please. Where do we get your 
Right, it's in our clinic. We don't even advertise it. Um, our, uh, it's kind of funny. Um, my friends and other they go, oh, you have to put it on the web. I said, what time do we have to do that? <laughs> our day starts at 4 in the morning, and my wife and I get home and usually write it the top of the day. So we just have it in clinic. And we have patients or, and or other folks who come to our, it's kind of funny to me. They come in and they, they'll ask for the supplement, they'll get the supplement, they'll know they go. We developed a, a we're, um, I didn't mention this, um, but only because we don't have it just yet. We have a, a patented formulation for joint health. And I'm, some of you may have heard um, uh, me talk about last time a compound called niacinamide for, for joint health as well. We've developed that since we spoke last time as a spray. So you tend, like this morning, yes, I took that, right? Along with my other supplements. I, well, God's grace, I don't have any joint issues, but to prevent it. So the idea is to take one of the capsule and 10 sprays, and if you want, it's great for the body, right? But it's also, it helps target uh, improving joint health, for example. And then the berberine product, that, like I said, that's, that's a bigger project. We've been working on it for about two and a half years. No. Yes. We do have stevia. I don't so, care about that. Yeah. I just want to make sure there's no more protection. Yeah, that's basically sugar. <laughs> yes, but sometimes it's derived from wheat. Yes. Allergies? Yes, absolutely. No, we don't. Yes, but. No, I'm a vegetarian. It stunted my growth. <laughs> I come from a, a, a Hindu family. Most Hindus are vegetarians, right? So I enjoy my mother's wonderful cooking and my wife's wonderful cooking. All right. And when you have that big meal, yeah. So um, my wife will sometimes um, make Indian food, right? And you know, our family comes from North India. That food, there tends to be a lot of oil, but my wife and my mom put almost no oil in the food. Or she'll make some uh, a stir fry with so the vegetables are still pretty crunchy, right? And she'll make it with, uh, sometimes with Indian spices and sometimes with some Chinese spices. In fact, I'm making myself hungry telling you that. <laughs> <laughs> but that's really the bulk of what we eat, right? Is we, um, North Indian diet, so South Indian diet is, is, is carbohydrate rich. North Indian diet is a, is a nice varied diet. There's no two, I, I never, I haven't had breakfast in years. I, but I did use steel. Steel cut oat meal is the best to have, not the instant. There's studies to show that if you're going to have, going to have breakfast and you like oatmeal, I like it. Put some yes, put some blueberries on top. And there you go. <laughs> right? Or you can put stevia or honey, right? Yes. So what about andrographs? Andrographs, what about that? So, for what purpose? I'm sorry. It cures most everything, but it's from India or someplace in there. Yes, no, the, the, I'm familiar with it, but yeah. was there a specific use that you were thinking of? So here, here's a, I make a general statement, right? Fruits and vegetables, fresh fruits and vegetables, you cannot beat them. And fresh herbs, you, you simply can't. Uh, I have patients here in the villages, I, I think there's some company that was marketing this about two years ago. And I, I had a, significant number of patients asking me about um, these capsules of veggie, you know, um, uh, freeze-dried uh, or uh, dried out vegetable pills and fruit pills, right? Yeah, so the patients are bringing in these, I mean, it's nicely packaged, it looks attractive, right? I said, yeah, it's good, but here's the deal, is when you dry out a fruit or a vegetable, some of the active uh, ingredients in it, compounds, you destroy them. So I said, yeah, it's, it's okay to take. It can't hurt you, right? But really, take a little extra effort to have fresh, fresh fruits and vegetables. I'll tell you, sometimes even before we have dinner, um, uh, one of the few things <laughs> a guy can do in the kitchen is take out some fresh vegetables and cut them. And my wife and I will have, eat a little salad while she's getting dinner ready. You can't beat that. Even, uh, you know, a, another, um, vegetable that's maligned is the onion. Onion is a fantastic vegetable, especially fresh, right? As a compound in a quercetin, 
which helps against COVID and every viral illness we know of. And there's other compounds that are profoundly anti-carcinogenic. So a little bit of raw onions, you can put it in your salad or if you like to eat it raw. Those are good as well. Yes? My mother asked me that same question last night. It was, it was, where do you find really high quality olive oil? There's a company out of Italy, uh, and they sell in the US off the web. That's the only one that I know. I have no financial interest in that company. I have to look it up. My mom was asking me, like, we were chatting about this um, in the evening. And she goes, can you send me that? She's staying with my sister and her family up in New York. And so uh, she goes, I was thinking about asking you this week. I said, so we were chatting about other things. And she goes, where do you find really high quality, uh, unadulterated oil? I said, there's this Italian company. I remember reading about it uh, intensively, maybe about six, eight months ago. I made a note of it. We have some at home, but I don't remember off the top of my head. I can tell Mary and yeah, she can share. Yeah, yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah, I'll get the name of it and yeah, put yeah. it together. We're, we're putting together a list of the organic farms around the area. Oh, that's um, the things like the good uh, the good olive oil, those kinds of things. And we'll have them here at hand out at the meetings. But uh, I'm putting that together right now because we all need to know where to get the good things and not be getting them at Walmart and Walgreens and, <laughs> and these other places where we know they're not, not good for us. So you were talking about onions and this probably put everybody off, but I'll tell you what, if you get a really, really good fresh onion out of the garden and you slice it thin and put it on gluten-free bread with some mayonnaise, it makes a great sandwich, I love it. <laughs> Going to the public's castle. <laughs> 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 thank you, thank you, Dr. Concho. Let's get Dr. Concho back to the